Welcome to Leading with Curiosity. Command and control leadership is dead. We interview leaders, entrepreneurs, and executive coaches challenging old paradigms and fostering cutting edge leadership. Here's your host, certified executive coach, Nate Leslie. Hello listeners. My guest today is significantly impacting my career in leadership development and executive coaching. It's my honor to share him with you today. He has courageous views on what it means to be a mentor and why we can't call ourselves one. He's been trained by members of the British SAS and spent years leading a program on the Isle of Skye where at-risk teens from tough parts of Glasgow and around Scotland had the opportunity to coach and be coached by executive leaders. Ian Chisholm is the founder of Roy Group Leadership in Victoria, British Columbia. I'm proud to be a learning lead and executive coach on his talented roster. If you care about the way you choose to show up as a leader and are curious about its impact on the atmosphere it creates in your organization, team, and family, stay with us. Ian, welcome to Leading with Curiosity. Hey, Nate. Thanks for having me, and thank you for such a nice introduction. Well-deserved. Hey, let's jump right in, Ian. Tell me about your convictions about the word mentor. Well, um, we have a lot of them in that uh, this concept of mentorship is really the North Star of uh, our firm at Roy Group. And so where to start? I think my number one conviction these days is that it's really relevant. Um, in the last year, we have seen the most capable country on earth falter in the face of something that it should have been able to ace. It has all the science and medical capacity. It has the logistics capacity to keep its citizens safe and to be an example for the world. And they did. They were not able to rise to that occasion. So what got in the way? That gives us a glimpse into what we're up against in terms of this modern era. And I guess my, my biggest conviction about mentorship is that mentorship is a is a force that we're going to need if we're going to address all of the issues that uh, COVID-19 has has exposed as, as part of this modern world. So I, I think it's something that leaders need to pay a lot of attention to. Mm. And I love when we call it a gift word. Let's go there. Yeah. Um, this was a that was a concept that was shared with me by a mentor of mine named uh, Bob Charche, who, uh, if you haven't met yet, Nate, you will. He's a learning lead for engagement, and he just introduced me to this idea of gift words. That there are some words that you can't call yourself. It 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 lessens the value of the word if you throw it around and take it on yourself. You actually have to earn it. Other people gift it to you if you've earned it in the story of their lives. And, and I think there's a lot of gift words like leader to me is best used as a gift word. Team to me is a gift word. We might be working together, but it actually takes somebody from the outside coming in to say, wow, you guys are really a team. I feel it. Right. And, and one of the most misappropriated gift words of all time is of course, mentor, which uh, we throw that word around a lot. And it's actually one of the most valuable gift words out there in that it's a, a very a very important moment when somebody refers to you as a mentor in the story of their life that's mm. that's a moment really worth earning for a lot of leaders i can't help but notice you led with talking about how important mentors are in the world and that it's a gift word if we're mm -hmm. lucky a couple of people might call us a mentor sure when this is all said and done. Yeah, and that, that's actually one of very few ways to measure leadership. Leadership is a very tough thing to measure across sectors uh, around the world. But to me, the number of times you earn that word mentor in the lives of other people tells me a lot about your ability to not only get challenging things accomplished, but to design that work in a way that develops the capacity of other people along the way. So mm. I think the number of times you earn the word is an, an important measurement to keep track of. Yeah. 
if we could explore it just a little more without uh, diving into you know the entire block of our <laughs> of our courses just this idea that there's a time and a place for different behaviors sure as a leader that lead to becoming a mentor and today let's say you know coach being one of them and you know putting away that desire to to tell people what to do yeah, and underneath underneath all of those options, I mean, we can choose to conduct ourselves in any way that we want in any given situation, but the discernment to know what it's time for, that's kind of right underneath the plot line. Mm -hmm. That when once a leader, and I think it takes time and I think it takes lots of experience, it also takes an openness to learning about all of the different options that you have. But when a leader can very clearly discern what it's time for and act accordingly in any given conversation, mm. maybe it is instruction, maybe it is um, advice, maybe it is, you know, a very clear briefing of key information. Maybe it's coaching somebody and positioning them to uh, learn from their own experience. Uh, that that gear shift is kind of underneath leadership more now than it ever has been in terms of choosing mm -hmm. the right way to have this conversation that's in front of me. Right. Nice. Let's, uh, I introduced you mentioning that you had been trained by members of the British SAS and we talked about conduct and coaching. Uh, what was your biggest takeaway through that experience and maybe maybe let's set it up as a bit of a story for the listeners because it's compelling just tell tell us about that experience yeah so um no it's it, it the way you said it sounds slightly dramatic so i just <laughs> want to make sure that uh, i hope that got people to listen to the podcast but let's just qualify this for sure uh yeah i came to my office one morning and there was an envelope on my desk saying that i had been accepted to a program called foundation. And I thought that was odd because I hadn't uh, applied for a program found, found it, called foundation. As soon as I opened it up and, you know, look, went online to find out what this program was, uh, I suddenly realized that a gentleman named Rod Stewart Lydon, who had been uh, one of our faculty members in Scotland, he worked as an instructor with a lot of our uh, groups of young people. He had been in the SAS and this program was actually designed for former members of the special forces. Their careers are so uh, steeped in leadership and teamwork that when they come out uh, of the military, there's this desire to kind of continue learning, but also to share what they had learned about leadership and teamwork. So. Um, suffice to say, it was a very challenging, rewarding, and memorable uh, program that I was able to take part in. Yeah, right on. And you've talked a lot about conduct, the way we carry ourselves, just the, the impact that, that, that the way we show up can have in all parts of our life. Um, what, what can you share with our listeners about conduct? I mean, I guess, I guess first of all, it, um, until recently, it was a very old fashioned word. We didn't mm -hmm. talk about conduct nearly as much as we talked about misconduct. But I think in terms of the political adventures of our neighbors to the south, the last four years, all of a sudden people are talking about, you know, presidential conduct. And is there is it important the way a person conducts themselves or can they just be, you know, totally free and say and do whatever they they think they want to do in that moment. Um, conduct is where everything that's going on inside us meets the rest of the world. And therefore, it's it's kind of the last outpost of choice where we get to choose how we show up in any given situation, a good situation or a bad situation. And so um, after 25 years of doing this work, I am just convinced that that is actually where a leader learns how to master themselves. Mm. It, it's being aware of the way that they conduct themselves in any given situation and choosing a conduct that will not only influence the situation, but will actually influence the people involved. Mm. Uh, the biggest mistake that I see 
from doing this work is that leaders underestimate the, the impact that their conduct has in any given situation. Therefore, it deserves attention and focus so that that's where mastery can begin. Nice. And hence our conversation about about the turtle and that learning through foundation, um, th th this idea of there is all sides of us, there are many dimensions to us, and we need to choose which we're bringing to the table. What can you expand on that for the listeners? Um, one of the key learnings from, from that program, and that program, I mean, that was 20 years ago now, and, and a lot of the learning is still with me, a big part of it was about self-awareness. What is it about the way that I'm interacting with, with my team, whether I'm the team leader or whether I'm a team member? What about my conduct is creating value? And what about my the way I'm conducting myself is actually getting in the way of us being able to move forward? And if you're not aware of uh, something that's on that ladder list, somebody else will make you aware of it. <laughs> uh, a big part of the program was getting feedback at the end of every day, uh, but also at the end of the session. I don't know if I've ever told you this part of the story, but um, all of your other team members, when the week is over, sit and talk for 45 minutes about you. And they don't hold any punches. They're probably never going to see you again. We came from you know, all over Europe. And... Uh, you just get a, a recording of a conversation that your five other team members have about you and the way you conduct wow. yourself and the things that you do that represents a positive contribution and the things that get in the way. Wow. Um, I've still got that cassette somewhere here in my desk 20 years later. Now the only problem is finding you know, somewhere I can play it. I was just thinking that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Well. Yeah, no, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. And and the big take home was, are you aware of yourself? And are you able to get a hold of yourself and, and make whatever changes you need to um, if what you're bringing is not, yeah. is not helpful? Yeah. It seems to me that if you described for us today a little bit about that program on the Isle of Skye and the impact that at-risk teens had coaching senior leaders of organizations and vice versa, it, it might shine a light on kind of how the Roy Group has come to be and the work that you and we are, are doing now. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that program? Yeah, and Nate, I mean, you will you will know that there are just some experiences in life that, you know, really shape you and shape your philosophy about what leadership is and what incredible teamwork is. Mm -hmm. um, the Gemini Project, which um, I co-created with a, a gentleman named Mark Bell, who's still a wonderful friend and a mentor and somebody that I learn a lot from, um, yeah, it came from a place of economic necessity. We had we had created a really great program called uh, the Leadership Academy for young people from tough socioeconomic backgrounds, and we were finding sponsors for groups of thirty kids at a time. And we were, you know, kind of a summer camp that ran all year round. They would start the program in the city, come up and spend a week on Sky, and then we would follow up with them down back in the city with a a community partner. Um, that was super rewarding work, but it was, um, in terms of the organization, it wasn't giving us a lift. We weren't, we weren't making any ground in terms of kind of coming out of, of, of some debt that, you know, we had acquired uh, during the startup. And so the Gemini project came about like so many things because of an economic necessity to innovate. Mm. Mm. And Mark was working a lot with the banks in Edinburgh. Uh, Edinburgh is a huge financial center, so there's a lot of headquarters there, and asked me point blank one day on a walk um, if I would ever feel confident putting, you know, 10 of our participants, young people from tough backgrounds in Glasgow, kind of toe to toe with financial executives. And I, I just had zero doubt that that would be a worthwhile interview. I just, I didn't doubt our participants at all. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so much of the work that we were doing was taking labels like underprivileged or disadvantaged 
and asking some questions about that to say, if you grow up in a tough situation, what are the results of that? Does that make you disadvantaged or underprivileged? Or does that actually hone something in you that's incredibly valuable, wow. that's incredibly resilient, that's incredibly resourceful, which of course the latter is true. So um, yeah, we began, we started taking groups of uh, 10 financial executives and 10 young people who had been through our programs, introducing them to the discipline of coaching. And in addition to the learning that they did beforehand, we would take the community stream through a process and then the corporate stream through a separate process, same exact material. They would come up to the Isle of Skye together for a week and every morning they would go through exercises or simulations together, you know, cracking some problem, mm -hmm. debriefing that, finding out what they had learned about themselves. And then every afternoon there would be a chance to practice coaching. So the executives would coach a young person from Glasgow and get feedback on that from somebody from our team. Wow. And then after a coffee break, we would turn the tables and the young person from Glasgow would coach the financial executive and coach them very well, because wow. uh, if there's one thing about Glasgow, it's uh, there's not a lot of fear when it comes to asking people some tough questions. <laughs> and so the, the kids from Glasgow were actually incredibly challenging, incredibly honest, and incredibly wow. effective in, you know, challenging the thinking of, of these financial executives. So yeah, no, it was just an amazing, it was an amazing piece of work. And we ended up uh, doing it several times over my last few years there. Wow. What came to mind for me there was the power of creating new ways of thinking about something that mm. clearly was a mm. new perspective, mm. whatever challenge that leader of a bank was facing. One of these teenagers brought a new way of thinking about it. And the other, which is something you and I wanted to talk about today, is the power of letting go of the need to have the answers for somebody. Mm -hmm. Coaching, mm -hmm. right? And when I try to describe to friends that have n haven't heard much about what is executive coaching and how can uh -huh. you help someone in another industry, right. it's those two things, creating an opportunity mm -hmm. and challenging someone on a new way of thinking about a problem that they've been the hamster's been on the wheel for a while. And, and the other one is the liberating feeling of, of saying, I don't need to have the answer for that person in the industry that I've never worked in. Right. I need to hold space and mm -hmm. ask the right questions. So it's, uh, it's that story is such a great metaphor for, uh, for really what we do as coaches, eh? Yeah, I think it is. It was almost like an exaggerated experiment to put some of yeah. those concepts to the test. And yeah. um, the impact that it had on both streams would say that there's there's something incredibly valuable about not knowing, which of yeah. course we spend our lives getting to a place where we do know and can offer value to a system because of what we know. Yeah, uh, That's why we go to a lawyer or to a doctor. It's because they know yeah. so much. Yeah. Um, Increasingly, uh, in a world where that idea of a leader knowing the answer in any given situation is is so far gone mm. in any industry, in any sector, there's too much to know. Yeah. And so um, rather than knowledge, what we're doing is is understanding that experience is very rich and it seasons people to be able to address whatever's in front of them without necessarily knowing what the answers are. Yeah. And can we get good at not knowing that that's a that's a that's a big question. And the answer is yes, there's some mm -hmm. people that can get very, very good at not knowing, but understanding what conduct and what questions and what processes allow a group to move forward, even into a territory that they don't understand. Yeah. The art of coaching of helping someone move from where they are now to where they want to be that's the art and the process of it and and every time you do it it's completely unique and different absolutely yeah just maybe explore uh your experience in like with our courses the practice of coaching and the leader's discipline just the journey that you've seen some of your past participants 
go on in the course of a program or over the course of your time working with a certain organization? Yeah, um, um, there's such a huge range of experiences that people go through. That's the nature of learning about coaching is that you actually uh, realize that you're a pretty u unique learner. But but some of the patterns I see is that uh, people, you know, when we start, they will say things uh, and, and they're being honest. They they think they're being honest. They'll say, I you know, I'm, I'm interested in brushing up my I'm interested in brushing up my style a bit, but I've actually been coaching people for, you know, several decades. Mm. And then we, you know, dive into it and find out what coaching is really about, as opposed to other options that leaders have, like instruction or advice or mm -hmm. uh, uh, sharing information. And normally at the end, people will say, you know, I started by saying, I thought I knew that I had been coaching for quite yeah. some time. Yeah. And I actually don't, I, I realize now that I may not have realized what coaching was yeah. and that actually this is kind of brand new, but I'm excited to go forward knowing what it is. Yeah. yeah. And Nate, I, I just think that's a very natural, that's a very natural outcome from the fact that our mental models about what coaching is are shaped from a very young age, we go and play minor league baseball or soccer or hockey or we yeah. and somebody's dad or mom is the coach of the team because they want to spend time with their own kid and they're totally winging it. Uh, if they do do a course, <laughs> it'll be about the rules of the game, yeah. but we don't we don't prepare coaches or, you know, uh, right. and so people just kind of wing it and they be themselves. And so that becomes what people believe coaching is and expand that out uh, to whatever level of sport and then add, you know, a nice big slice of Hollywood movies that want to make it exciting and want to make it dramatic. And so it needs the great dressing room speech. I think of Al Pacino in any given Sunday, right? Life's about inches and all this <laughs> yeah. bullshit. And so we just we, we we we're pretty sure that we know what coaching is. And once you dig into it, you just find out that there's a whole discipline there. There's a whole body of knowledge and a whole history of where this came from. And suddenly we realize that we didn't know really what it was all about, even though we'd convinced ourselves we, we have. Yeah. And as you know, and some of my listeners might, that's the world I came from in sport and hockey and developing volunteer coaches. And a number of years ago, when I kind of stumbled on stumbled upon this other type of coaching, and I, when I saw the definition, and I witnessed it kind of happen, I'm sort of looking around thinking, what have I been doing for 15 years? And, ah. and, and I think I've shared this story with you, the day I decided to start asking more questions to children than telling them what to do. It was in a Roy group workshop when we were together in Kananaskis, this idea of what I still need to instruct. Okay, couple teaching points, then ask them right. about it. And that right. was the, that was the game changer, right? And um, I was just sort of stopped in my tracks thinking, wow, I've had, I've been carrying the weight of uh, needed to all that knowledge. <laughs> all that, this knowledge is heavy. Uh -huh. It's heavy. It's in my head. It's, it's on true. my shoulders. It's in my backpack. And, and then, you know, of course, suddenly all the hundreds of volunteer coaches we've worked with in, in, in hockey over the years, suddenly realizing that they bring all this other great human experience from other parts of their life. And, uh -huh. you know, just because they're wearing jeans and didn't bring a whistle and have a, you know, full cage on the ice and, you know, haven't quite figured out how it might benefit them to look like a hockey coach when you're trying to coach hockey the kids look at you a little differently when you when you look the part uh, but they had all this other knowledge from the rest of their life you know that sure. they can bring in and apply but the the pressure release valve in in my own kind of fork in the road to to never go back the other way has just been so awesome and suddenly have more space available for lots of things uh, yeah, it's 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 part. so easy whether it's a classroom teacher or a principal or a leader in an organization or a hockey coach you you can immediately tell if someone's focus is on the quality of the teaching 
or the quality of the learning. Mm, yeah. And I think for most of us, we spend our lives thinking that those two words are interchangeable, when in fact, that's a very different focus. Yeah. Um, I want to be, I want to teach well, versus I want to create really deep learning. Those are two very different focuses. Mm -hmm. And you got to shift. Yeah, you got to shift to a focus on learning if you really want to be masterful at coaching. And I have a strong bias there that just keeps coming up when we are challenged or questioned about, well, when is it time to instruct? I have to do this training, right? Whether it's participants in our programs, having my master's in, in, in education from the IB curriculum of, of inquiry-based learning and a mother who spent 30 years working in an international school after 15 years in, a, in the Canadian system, great teaching is about letting kids explore right. an idea and ask mm -hmm. their own mm -hmm. questions. Right. And so many adults that happen to be in an important instructor role, training role in their organizations kind of glaze right over that and, and go to delivery of everything in the binder, you know? And, and um, sure. so there's a, it, it's just so intertwined and it, and it has an opportunity to surface many times a day and to kind of connect the, the conversation we're having today brings that all back to this idea of mentor of there's a time for a little instruction there's a time to say nothing and see what they figure out on their own there's a time to give feedback or ask about how that experience went and none of that has the pressure to be right all the time no and it takes um it takes a high level of awareness to make that choice to yeah. be like i'm actually going to choose to play it this way for the next little while to see how this goes before i just go to my unconscious defaults yeah oh that that's big work uh for people that's a lot that takes a lot of energy to be that wide awake to what's actually happening and what's required as it applies to entrepreneurship for any small business owners uh, listening right now, I love Tim Ferriss's idea in the four hour work week, which is not about how to work four hours a week necessarily. It's about if I only had four hours in a week, what would how I should I be spending them? Mm -hmm. What should I do? And as we talk about very, co very coachable people have a high degree of skill and a high degree of will. He talks about risk as well in that what's this going to cost me if this goes mm -hmm. wrong? Mm -hmm. Hundred dollars, five hundred dollars, ten. It doesn't matter. Everyone has a threshold, depending on what you know what the project is. But what's the worst that can happen if I let someone go for it and try to figure it out? Right. And so I'm always sort of drawn back to that degree of risk. And 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 of course, over time, the more we can help people learn to think critically, it's critical thinking skills is really what this, whether education or coaching come comes down to. Uh, the less they come knocking on on your door for more answers, right? Yeah. Well, and the and the less risk in the long term, the less risk you're actually taking because you've got so much more capacity yeah. in your organization. So you can manage, you know, you can control the short term risks, or you can actually take those risks in a really measured way to build capacity. Right. To build capacity, you've got to take some risk. Yeah. This might fail. Yeah, you got to hold that. You can try to contain it. You can try to learn as much, but but it is important that we do have some risk yeah. in our story every day if we want to get to a, a more capable team. Yeah. yeah. Will the building burn down if I hand over the control of this project? And if right. the answer is yes, well, what if we just had a fire extinguisher ready in the event we absolutely needed it, and then the ring stays on the fire extinguisher because you almost never need it. Right. right when you actually when you right. actually let go as we wrap up here chiz what uh, what can people uh do to learn a little bit more about what the roy group offers in terms of open courses and organizational development uh, roygroup.net is probably the best place um we're on uh twitter and facebook and instagram and everything else but i think the the, the website's probably the best place to go where they get to see uh, smiling faces like yours. 
uh, yeah, very up for a conversation to find out uh, what's really going on for people and what they need and, and if somebody inside our group or somebody that we know is the right person to help. So it always starts with a conversation. Right on. And this experience over the last year has created some new opportunities there. There will be a return to in-person, but also mm. a, a, a transition to, to virtual, hasn't it? Yeah, I think like many people, we're, uh, we know what our business looked like in the before times. <laughs> we know what our business looks like, has looked like in the last 14 months. And now we have some big choices uh, of what our business will look like, you know, starting this fall, question mark. Yeah. And I think um, for us, the guiding principle has been what is most impactful for our clients. And that will be the primary design principle that we work backwards from is to give them learning experiences that will stick with them for the rest of their life. Whatever combination of online and in person, whatever gaps there are in between the formal learning so that people can go experiment with it themselves, mm -hmm. whatever that most impactful rhythm is, is the rhythm that we want the band to play. So. That sounds like you're focusing on the learning and not the teaching. <laughs> uh, th there's been a lot to learn from the last 12 yeah, months, I can yeah. tell you that. Ian, thank you very much for your time. This is Ian Chisholm, founder of the Roy Group Leadership in Victoria. You can learn more at roygroup.net. Thanks, Nate. Thanks for listening to Leading with Curiosity. Please share, follow, and rate the show so that other leaders can make positive change in the world. Connect with Nate at natelesley.ca. And remember, the brain behaves very differently when encouraged to think rather than told to listen.